Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for the Aboriginal Rights uh, Research Office for uh, assisting and to have uh, myself come here today. And thank you for uh, Council for uh, allowing me to come here and speak today. Uh, so my name is Jeremy Bouchard. I am a lawyer, a partner with Gowling WLG. I am one of the class counsel on the Federal Day School class action. Uh, and so I'm here today uh, to provide you with information about the class action. I just wanted to stay, say right up front, there's no deadlines yet. So no one's missed anything. You don't have to worry about any deadlines right now that will impact your rights or your ability to participate in this. There is, there is plenty of time yet, so I just wanted to reassure you of that. So, again, my name is Jeremy Bouchard. I'm, uh, I'm originally from Six Nations. I was born and raised on Six Nations. I went to uh, a day school on Six Nations. Uh, I'm a uh, Mohawk. I, am, I have to add that my dad is Ojibwe from Northern Ontario, a community called Gull Bay, so I'm often referred to as an Ojimo. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's kind of my background. I've, uh, when I was younger, I remember my parents used to bring me uh, to Aquasasne. Uh, I think uh, we had come, I'd come here quite a few times when I was a kid. And so it's always nice to be here. The weather was beautiful all today, and I love having uh, the beautiful water here. Uh, you know, in Ottawa right now, we've got water, but it's flooded. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to be here today. I'm really happy to see that there's such a very large crowd. I think when I was first told that we would have some people here, it was around maybe 20 or 50. Uh, so it's, it's a bit larger, and that's good to see. What I want to do is uh, just really walk you through uh, the day school class action. And I thought that was up higher, but maybe it dropped a bit. Um, just for the benefit of anyone uh, who didn't get any of the paperwork yet, we do have an information sheet. I think more copies are going to be provided. They're just printing those out right now. And there's a registration form. And I'll, and I'll speak to those, what they mean. And, and what you do or don't have to do with respect to those. Um, so what I want to do is just provide a little bit of background about the class action itself, some of the history, uh, maybe talk a little bit about Gary McLean, how the action started and where we are today. Uh, and then I want to talk a bit about what are uh, Federal Indian Day Schools, as well as a little bit about class actions and the classes that are a part of this action. Uh, I'll speak a bit about compensation, about what compensation will look like under this process, and what people will be required to do to apply for that compensation. And I'll just say right now, the application process for compensation hasn't started. What we have here are just registration forms. Um, those aren't official applications, they just register you with us, the class council, class uh, firm that has uh, been certified for this action. I'll then go through uh, a bit on the current status and what our next steps are. I'll talk a bit about some of the outreach that we've done. And then what I'll do is at the end, uh, I'll have, I'll, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I would ask if you can kind of keep the questions to the back end because the presentation will sometimes address those. So if you can try to keep the questions to the end, happy to answer every question. And uh, when the presentation is done, I'm happy to stay here for a bit afterwards uh, to talk to you if you have individual questions. Uh, happy to speak to you as well. Uh, I'll just say that normally I would have a, a partner here with me. Uh, but he came into my office this morning and said that his passport had, had expired on Friday, uh, so he was not able to attend. Uh, so, yeah, we could have taken a vote, I guess. <laughs> Next time, I'll, uh, I'll make those, I'll seek those arrangements out. 
So I'll just start by talking a little bit about the history of the action. Uh, talk a little bit about Gary McLean and how this action started out in uh, Manitoba. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you ever saw Gary or met Gary, uh, but Gary McLean uh, was uh, Soto. Uh, he was from the Lake Manitoba First Nation in uh, Manitoba. And uh, Gary sadly passed away uh, in February. Uh, he was the one that really started this action back in 2009. And he was the representative plaintiff who did a lot of work in terms of uh, engaging the government and talking to a lot of communities and leadership to try to get this moving. Um, and so Gary, uh, back in 2005-2006 uh, is when the uh, IRS settlement agreement was coming to, a, coming to an end when they were finalizing that. Um, a lot of people talked about their experience at a day school and how come that wasn't included in the Indian Residential School settlement process. And so back then, uh, Gary and a number of his friends were together and they talked about their experience at day school, their day school at the Lake Manitoba First Nation. And Gary talked to uh, a number of his friends and they talked about sort of their treatment, what it was like being at the day school. And it was the first time that he really opened up to somebody about it. Uh, and he talked about a lot of the abuse, the, uh, the physical abuse, if anybody wants one of those. Uh, he talked about the physical abuse and Gary, in his case, uh, disclosed that he had been sexually abused by a nun. And he disclosed this to his uh, friends for the first time. And they disclosed to him that they too were abused. And what he began to realize is that a lot of individuals who attended the school uh, had suffered the same type of abuses, uh, uh, physical abuse, in a lot of cases sexual abuse. There was also psychological abuse. And so really, you know, what they talked about was um, getting their ears pulled, uh, getting their hair pulled, getting hit with objects, uh, for speaking their language, for not speaking English. Uh, in some cases, people who wore uh, like a leather vest, we've heard stories of people who wore leather vests or moccasins. Uh, the teaching staff would uh, punish them for that. But Gary talked about this for the first time with a number of his friends, and what they realized was a lot of people who attended that day school suffered the same experience. And so that really for him was what motivated him and a number of other individuals to come forward and start this action in 2009. And so that's really the history of it where it starts back in 2009 in, in Winnipeg. And what it is, is it's, it's an action against the federal government, just the federal government, for its <coughs> role in the operation, uh, administration, and management of what were called, what are called Indian Day Schools, federal Indian Day Schools. Um, these are the schools uh, and students who were excluded from the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement process. And so, Really, what this action was always about for Gary was about getting some measure of justice for those students who attended schools and were harmed and the impact on their families. Um, in terms of um, day schools, what are, what are federal Indian day schools? In short, right, right now what we've done is um, is class council when we first started this act when we first were retained on this action in 2016 one of the first things we did is we can we conducted a study uh, to find out the size of the class uh, and to identify schools uh, so we had uh, several very large research firms who were engaged in researching and identifying schools. And so as of now, we've identified over 718 day schools across Canada. Uh, these schools were established, funded, and managed by the government of Canada, by the federal government. 
Uh, now, on the ground, day to day, uh, while the federal government was controlling all of this, on the ground, these schools were often run by the religious organizations and institutions. So, we see a lot of, uh, for example, a lot of schools had nuns in them at a period of time. Uh, others, there was a strong presence of fathers, uh, in, in a lot of religious uh, personnel that were at these institutions. Uh, but at the end of the day, behind it all, it's Canada, it's the federal government that was controlling it. Uh, so, in general, these are the schools that students attended by day only, returning home at night. Um, I think what you would typically see in a lot of cases is it, what we've seen is schools, the single classroom schools, maybe it's a double classroom, uh, but they were kind of small, packed in, uh, and these are the type of schools that we're looking at. We've sort of, we've traveled across Canada uh, to, to a number of communities, and we've listened to survivors, to leadership, and essentially quite across the board, we've heard that there was significant physical abuse, um, and, and in some cases sexual abuse, a lot of psychological abuse, and uh, an impact on language and culture. Um, so a lot of students talked about getting, you know, their ears pulled, their hair pulled, uh, hitting, getting hit with rulers, uh, getting hit with a strap, uh, someone who speaks their language being punished for that. So it's, it's not like just normal circumstances um, where, for example, myself, when I was in day school uh, and I attended and I did something wrong and I got strapped, that was for doing something bad, not listening to the rules. But a lot of the abuse we're talking about here is the abuse where somebody spoke their language or did something that was related to culture in most cases. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So right now, again, the settlement agreement is online. At, uh, for those of you that are in internet savvy, it's indiandayschools.com. Schedule K lists all of the schools. Um, and so that's where you'd want to go if you want to look at that. Right now, it, we do sort of, uh, we do have a process in place where if we're missing a school, we welcome information or evidence to sort of give a little more information on that and we can look at where that fits in this class action. Um, so just really quickly what Indian day schools are not. So as I previously mentioned, they're not Indian residential schools. They're generally separate institutions. Although they did use the same curriculum, they did use the same teaching methods. Um, in a lot of cases, you see the same teachers that are sort of uh, moving between institutions. Um, what I will say is uh, Indian day schools are not provincial schools. So the schools, for example, that were off the community uh, in an adjacent community, a non-indigenous community, a lot of uh, individuals uh, took a bus or were transported to a neighboring community to attend a provincial school or a non-federal day school. Those schools are not included in this action. Those would have to constitute a separate class action. Um, I think I just want to speak really quickly about Godfordson and day scholars, just to sort of uh, talk about that in the sense that right now there is another class action out there. It's called Godfordson, and it covers students who attended a residential school by day only and returned home at night. So they didn't reside at a recognized uh, Indian residential school. Those students are typically referred to as day scholars. That is a different class action than ours. Ours is not related to those schools because there's already a class action that's been started for that. So if you fall in those circumstances, you would want to contact that uh, law firm that is handling that action. Um, so that's just that on the, uh, just to explain the day scholars. So this is a class action lawsuit. 
which means it falls under its own set of rules applicable to litigation. So in this case here, we have well over 100,000 individuals who have suffered the same type of harm and same experience. And so that's why it's a class action. It would be quite difficult to have 100,000 individual actions. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. It's a class action. All of the claims are included in one uh, in this class action. Um, so we have two classes in our class action. We have the survivor class and the family class. For the survivor class, the survivor class is essentially the students who attended. So anyone who attended falls in the survivor class. We commissioned a expert report to get a handle on the number of individuals who uh, would be uh, still alive who fell within this class. Uh, because remember, this is an aging class. Uh, this, is, this is an older uh, demographic or group of people who experienced this. So right now, while well, this is October 2017, our expert estimated that there was anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 survivors who were still alive and eligible for this class action. So that was in 2017. We also asked the expert to tell us how many people passed, were passing away. Um, and so he told us that approximately uh, 2,000 survivors who would be eligible for this class action pass away annually. On a daily basis, it works out to approximately five people. And so for us, and Gary McLean in particular, that was pretty significant. That was a high number of people who potentially would not see any measure of justice. Um, so that's why Gary really pushed to have this settlement completed uh, on an, uh, as quick as possible, just because of the rate of people who were passing away. Uh, my partner, Robert Winogron, is not here today. Uh, he, he usually, he tells a story about how Angel Sampson, our representative plaintiff in BC from British Columbia, uh, would call him almost on a daily basis with an up and tell him of the number of people who were passing away on a daily basis who were eligible for this. And so that's why we really pushed forward on this uh, aggressively. The family class, is the second class in this class action. So we have the survivor class and the family class, two classes. For the, the family class uh, includes spouses, former spouses, ch children, grandchildren, and the siblings of class members. It's a very large group. It's, it's essentially all the f family members of a survivor member. And I'll explain how that fits into this uh, momentarily. So the class period, the class period in, in a class action is significant. There has to be a start date and an end date. Um, and so in this case here, it's fairly clear when it starts. Uh, the start date, the eligible start date for a day school is fairly clear and that in most cases you can identify when the school opened. If the school opened and it was a federal day school, that's your start date. We go back as far as 1920, when similar to Indian residential schools, there were changes, <coughs> legislative changes, legal changes that required attendance <coughs> at schools. To us, that's a significant starting point. So as early as 1920 is when the, the start date can start for a school. The end date uh, for the class period is a little, it's, it's different, it can be different. It's not like all the schools closed at a certain time. So for the end date, what we look at is in some cases, the schools were closed, they were destroyed, they burned down, something happened to them. It's easy in those cases to say when the school ended. Um, but in other days, in other cases, what we're looking at is the transfer of administration. So at some point, the nation, a nation, said to Canada, we want control over our school, and we don't want you to have any control over this. That is the end date for a lot of, a lot of schools. 
is when you see the school transfer from federal government control to the nation's control. And that's where we stop. That's where liability stops for our purposes. Compensation. So I'll speak uh, about this. This is kind of one of the more, this is certainly one of the significant uh, pieces of this litigation. Now, what I can say is this, is when we first started this litigation, when we, uh, when Gowling WLG and, and the team that, is, is, that stands around me, when we were first asked by Gary McQueen to assist him on this, this file had been dormant, it had, it had just languished for seven years. Uh, nothing had been done on it. It had been filed and it sat there. And they came to us and they said, can you help us get this to the finishing line? And so when we looked at it, we developed a strategy how we thought we could move this forward aggressively. And part of that was certainly what we wanted to see was, and what we wanted to hear was input from community members. Community members, community leadership, and so we did go out, we did go to communities, we did take the opportunity to listen, to hear about experiences, to know what worked and what didn't work, so that when we developed the claims process, it would be something that wasn't uh, re-traumatizing, or at least limited it. It was something that would be uh, better than what had been done before. So, what we did is, uh, we went out to communities, we spoke to community members, and what we learned also was that, I think one of the key things I wanted to say is that when we, we approached Canada on this, um, you know, we had to say that, in our view, everyone who attended a school suffered some harm. Anyone who attended a day school, because of the inherent harmful nature of the school, everyone suffered some harm, whether it was physical harm, whether it was exposure to harm, seeing other children get harmed, whether it was student on student abuse, whether it was being uh, called down by the teacher uh, for doing something, for saying something. Everyone in our view had experienced harm. And so for that, we thought that everyone should be eligible for compensation just for attending. And so the, what we came up with is what we, where we landed is that our view was that everyone who attended should be entitled to direct compensation. So as part of this process, everyone who attended a federal Indian day school within the class period will be eligible for base compensation and then from there it goes up. So the base compensation right now is uh, 10,000 and then from there it goes up to 50,000, uh, 100,000, 150,000, topping out at uh, 200,000. And so right now under this claims process that is the compensation compensation scheme. Um, what we heard was that people didn't want to have a complex process. They didn't want a process like the Indian Residential Schools independent assessment process. So for us, we wanted to ensure that we designed a claims process that was simple, user friendly, culturally appropriate, and non-adversarial. We didn't want survivors, particularly an aging population, to have to be cross-examined on their stories, like in the independent assessment process. Uh, we just heard far too many stories of people who went through the independent assessment process and were really harmed as part of that process, having to tell their story multiple times, having to be cross-examined by a uh, crown lawyer and uh, adjudication system was really hard on people. And so we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to make it less legal. So as part of this process, it will be a paper-based process. There will be no cross-examinations. 
We've designed this so that it's an application form where for some people who choose to go through this process, if they want to do it on their own, they will be able to go through this process on their own with minimal support. Where people require the support, we will make legal resources available. And so that's the process we have right now. It's a paper-based process. Um, it's an application form, essentially. Uh, this application form uh, will become available, the final draft, uh, once the court approves the settlement agreement. Um, and so we're looking at a harms assessment grid. Like I said, it's the base amount will be 10,000, essentially for the 10,000 component. Uh, someone essentially needs to fill out the application form. You check off the harms. There are boxes that you would check off. You have somebody witness your signature. So you don't need someone to read it, your application. Your application be, can be private and stay here. They just need to see the applicant sign. And that's all the witness is doing for levels one and two. So it preserves confidentiality. So no one has to hear about that. And it's easier for people to do that. And so that's one of the key things I wanted to mention. In terms of a payment, it will be a single payment under this process. So what we mean by that is if you, if you attended multiple schools, maybe you attended two day schools, you'll still only be entitled to one payment, but it will look at your experience uh, the entire experience. So what you would look at is you would want to identify what was your most significant harm and that would be the way you would be assessed. Um, so it's one payment regardless of the number of schools attended. I'll just really quickly, uh, just to look at the harms assessment grid, just for level one to show you, to sort of give you just a taste or a flavor of what will be required to meet that minimal threshold, which we believe everyone will qualify for. Uh, we're really looking at verbal abuse and physical abuse at that level one base compensation. So examples of, and this is just examples, there can be other things that happen. Examples include mocking, denigration, or humiliation by reason of Aboriginal identity or culture. So if you spoke your language and they said something to you about that that was not appropriate, you would qualify. Um, threats of violent or intimidating statements. So if teachers indicate uh, threatening to the student, that would be qualified. Uh, sexual comments as well, uh, physical abuse, um, uh, physical abuse related to discipline or punishment. Those are the key items to get to the base level, level one. So we're, we're fairly confident that eligibility for level one will largely be available to everyone. And it goes up from there, it progresses uh, further. I think just a real quick thing on estates or deceased loved ones. We've heard a lot about, uh, we've had a lot of questions from people about uh, people who passed away. And we know that in this case, um, the population we're dealing with. I went to a presentation in Northern Ontario about three weeks ago and uh, the group of individuals who were there were all in their 80s. Um, so we know that in a lot of cases it's, a, it's an older population, it's an aging population. Um, so we know and we've heard a lot about people who passed away. And I think Gary McLean is an example of uh, sort of the aging population and the need to sort of reach a settlement. Uh, fairly quickly, but in the end, what I would say is, under this process, the executor of estates will be able to apply on behalf of deceased loved ones. Um, so, if someone's passed away, an estate claim can be made on their behalf. In that case, there we have a date. It goes back to 2007, so July 31st. 2007. 
how did we get to 2007? Um, so, in terms of the law, in general, there is a two-year limitation period that you have to commence an action. So, generally across the board, to commence an action against someone, you have about two years. And so what we did is we looked at the general limitation period, which is two years, and we looked at the date when this claim was first filed in Manitoba, which was 2009. So what we did is we pushed it back two years from that. Uh, we did get some pushback on that, uh, but eventually we landed on 2007, July. So if someone's passed away between now and July 31st, 2007, their, their estate can still make a claim. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're trying to let people know, because if you fall in those circumstances, we would encourage you to work with others, your family or whoever, to make sure that the estate is put in place and everything is okay on that piece. That way the estate can make a claim. Um, so, compensation principles. Um, one of the key things we wanted to do was to make sure that the principles of compensation were well laid out. Uh, in that sense, there were a couple of key principles that we wanted to bake into the settlement agreement. So we wanted to make sure that these principles were reflected in the settlement agreement. So if any dispute arose as to the interpretation and application of the settlement agreement, uh, we could revert back to these and say, look, this is the way this application process, this, this claims process was intended to be implemented. And so Canada, again, was hesitant at first, uh, but we managed to get these principles included in the settlement agreement. And some of these principles, so if we look at number one, we're looking at the claims process is intended to be expeditious, so move forward uh, quickly, uh, cost effective. So if people want to go through this process and not pay any out-of-pocket legal fees, they can do that. They have access to uh, class counsel, which is our firm, at no charge to them. Uh, User-friendly, we've tried to put this as simple as possible in an application form. Uh, the evidentiary requirements, we've made those as low as possible and we've tried to make it so that uh, friends can, can be the witness uh, to statements. Um, so we've tried to make it user friendly and culturally sensitive. Uh, one of the key things that we are making sure happens is that in this place there will be a claims administrator that will accept the applications from individuals and will review those applications and make a decision. So what we said to the, to the claims administrator or to the process, what we want is to ensure that the claims administrator has cultural sensitivity training. Uh, all people who work there that are dealing directly with community members need to have that training to understand the sensitivities that are there and they're culturally appropriate. Um, number two, we really wanted to, we heard a story of a gentleman uh, who uh, went through the IAP process and I should say, if you receive compensation through the IAP process for attending an Indian residential school, that is a separate institution. You're still entitled to be a part of this process. It doesn't uh, exclude you from uh, benefiting from this process as well. But what we heard from this individual was he went through the IEP process. Uh, he was so traumatized that he had to self-medicate for about a month after. Uh, he just, it was so hard for him to have to go through that process. And he said, to us that they made him out to be a liar. And it, it really hurt him and it impacted him. And he sort of went off the grid for about a month. And so these are, and we've heard many of other stories, uh, we heard stories about people who didn't make it through the IAP process, they were so traumatized. And so we wanted to avoid that. So 
<laughs> Number two, the goal of minimizing the, the likelihood of re-traumatization. How we achieve that is there will be no cross-examination. So at no point will a government lawyer sit across from you and question you about what happened, if it happened, how many times it may have happened. In this case, there is a, there is a, a presumption of honesty and good faith. Um, key thing. Um, and all of these are reflected in the settlement agreement under the principles governing claims administration. So this is how the claims administrator must apply the claims process. If there is a dispute with Canada over any aspect of this process, of this litigation, uh, in the implementation stage, it has to be governed by these principles. Um, I'm on slide 10 of 16, just to let you know. Um, so the process, I wanted to speak really quickly about the claims, uh, the claims process. Uh, we've, we've put a lot of thought into the claims process. We really tried to design a process that was uh, good for class members, that didn't traumatize them, that allowed them to go through this uh, with some degree of simplicity. Um, on that note, we've also put in uh, three review mechanisms. So I'll speak to those. So right now, the first step would be a class member submits an application. The official application hasn't been completed yet. We have a draft here in the settlement agreement, but it's been completely redone. It is a lot different than what it looks here. Um, it's an application process that will be approved by the court, and I'll give you the date on that. So class members will receive an application. So this is all after the settlement agreement has been approved. So on September 13th, 14th, and 15th, we will be attending court in Winnipeg, Manitoba, federal court, where we will go before the judge, and we will present the case for approval. If the judge approves it, it'll probably take some time for him to make his decision and write the decision, but following that is when the compensation process will begin. And, and so the first step in that will be in an application. And so people will be provided an application, they'll be invited to complete the application. Some people can do it on their own, but we will make resources available on the ground to assist people to handle, to deal with the application. Um, so it's stage one, you do an application. Uh, we've set it up so applicants can choose where they believe they fit in. Um, on the application form, there are five levels, and we've set it up so people can choose where they uh, fit within this uh, grid. There will be assistance available for people who need the additional assistance. From there, it's submitted to the claims administrator. The administrator, in this case, will look at it to make sure the document collection is complete. The administrator can send it back and ask for additional documentation. Um, they can also, uh, if, uh, so they can send it back and ask for additional documentation. If someone applies for a level three and the claims administrator says, well, I think you're a level two, that will be sent back to the applicant will have the opportunity to provide additional information. The um, administrator will provide reasons as to why they're sending it back. That individual will have access to legal counsel to assist them on that. But if it's sent back by the claims administrator, um, at that stage, the applicant can always ask the claims administrator to reconsider their application. So if you submit an application and you're not happy with it, you're still able to ask for a reconsideration. It's not, uh, it's not called an appeal, but it effectively is the same thing. It's a reconsideration. From there, uh, if they're still not happy, we have the opportunity for a third party review. So if you're not happy with the, uh, the reconsideration by the claims administrator, you can still go to third party review and have it reviewed again. Again, you'll have assistance to that process as well. 
If you're still not happy, we have something called the Exceptions Committee that has the authority to look at it again. So for those people who, have, who may have heard that there's no appeal or there's no opportunity to have this reconsideration or have it uh, appealed, there are three levels of review available under this process. Um, so compensation, um, just uh, on the speaking to the family class, unlike the survivor class, um, the family class, there is no direct compensation for family class members. In this case, the scope and size of the family class is significantly larger than the survivor class. It is a very large group of individuals. And so, on this case, uh, there will be no direct compensation, but what we did do is we got a commitment from Canada to put aside, set aside funding for a number of initiatives. And so, as part of that, Canada has committed to putting aside 200 million for a legacy fund. This legacy fund will be administered by a not-for-profit corporation, and it'll have four principal funding objectives. The first being healing initiatives. So part of this 200 million will be used to fund community-based healing initiatives. It'll be an application process where communities will be able to apply and it's subject to the application. Uh, funding will be available for healing initiatives at the community level. Uh, you're looking for uh, funding uh, activities in the community. We really want this to be something that is carried out uh, at the community level. Uh, and a significant amount of the 200 million is for healing initiatives. Uh, cultural and language revitalization. Um, we've heard a lot about the impact on language and culture. Uh, Gary McLean spoke uh, Soto when he went, when he started at day school. He used to tell a story that within the first five minutes of attending school, he was being strapped for speaking his language. Because the teacher talked to him and he responded in Soto. And for that, he was strapped. And, and I, you know, I've, I can't say how many people I've talked to who had the same experience. And so we know that there's been an impact on language and culture. So the second most significant funding initiative will be cultural and language revitalization initiatives. Uh, those will be, again, application-based, uh, community-based funding uh, for those. Uh, community-based uh, focused commemorative events. Uh, we've heard uh, in some communities, uh, some communities would like to be able to have some sort of an event in the community um, where they're able to bring community members together. In some cases, it's been described as potentially a ceremony, a feast, um, but some sort of a gathering where the community has funding available to bring community together on an occasion to at least talk about uh, the, co the commemoration of the settlement of this and to at least try to, to have a community discussion and begin the process of moving forward. Um, so each community impacted will be provided with the financial resources to have some uh, one event in their community. The final one is something called the Truth Telling Forum. Um, we certainly know that uh, is part of healing for individuals. Uh, a lot of people, for some people I should say, uh, and we've heard this quite consistently, they want to be able to tell their story. Uh, and it's part of the healing process for some people. Uh, some people who have been traumatized uh, by an event like this need to be able to share and talk about their experience. And so that's what we were trying to do with the Truth Telling Forum, is what that is going to be is it's going to be a body that travels both nationally and regionally to host events, Truth Telling Forums, where people will be invited to come and speak and share their story. Uh, the intent would be to make it a, a safe and, and environment where people feel comfortable coming forward, where they have that, they have the, the right, the option to come forward and share their story, to speak with others. And part of this uh, will be for healing for some, 
for some to just get together with other people who have similar experiences and be able to talk about it. Um, I think what I would say on that as well is um, the ideal there as well is, to, is that there was and there is an educational component to that. And what I mean by that is the ideal would be that the stories told there and the information that's, that's made known would also um, help educate those individuals out there who don't know about the day school system. So the, there, there is people out there who have no information about what happened at federal day schools, the type of abuse, the type of harm that happened. And so we thought this would be also an opportunity to at least share that experience and educate another component of our population who might not be aware of what happened, uh, the abusive and harmful nature of these schools. Um, so just really quickly, current status, uh, is, as I noted, uh, we were retained on this file in 2016, uh, May, uh, Gary came to us and asked us to help him out with this. Uh, by June 21st of 2018, which just happened to be Inter uh, National Indigenous Day, uh, Justice Phelan of the Federal Court certified this class action is a class proceeding, uh, as well as uh, certifying Gowling WLG, myself, and a number of colleagues is the class counsel. Um, and so that was a procedural step that we were able to achieve and it happened on National Indigenous Day, which was quite interesting. Um, by December 6, um, Gary McLean and the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Minister Bennett, did make a public announcement about agreement and principle on Parliament Hill. Uh, at that time, Gary was still with us and Gary met with the minister and announced that in terms of the basic elements of the settlement, we had reached an agreement on those, subject to drafting the settlement agreement. And so from there, after that, on March the 12th, uh, 2019, the named plaintiffs and Minister Bennett announced the signing of a settlement agreement. Uh, sadly, uh, a couple of weeks before that, Gary McLean passed away. Uh, and so that's sort of the current status is that um, we are at a stage now where we have a signed settlement agreement <clears throat> and right now where we are we're in something called the notice period we're in a 60-day period before uh, we go to court for settlement approval here and this 60-day notice period um, is a period when we provide notice to everyone uh, about the terms of the settlement, uh, what the compensation will look like, what the process will look like. This information is provided to the public and you can find it at our website IndianDaySchools.com. There is information there that summarizes everything and all of the legal documents are there if you care to read them. But this is all with the intention that people have the right to see this information to comment on this information. And that is a fundamental right of this process, to have access to that information, to tell us about your concerns. Um, we have an information sheet here that we provided. That information sheet has all of our contact information. Uh, we have a website, we have a Facebook page, we have, uh, I think it's called Twitter, and we have uh, email contacts and a 1 800 number. And people are invited to contact us and share their thoughts and concerns. Um, so that's where we're at right now. We will be going to court, as I mentioned, on May uh, 13, 14, and 15. Uh, I would say that the only thing in between, so right now, there really are no deadlines. The, what right now is class members. Um, we have the only thing that you can do if you really would like to right now is on May 3rd, there is a, a period where you can provide a letter of objection or a letter of support. Um, those are two things that can be done by May 3rd. So if you agree with the settlement agreement, you think it's something that works for you, 
you're entitled to follow a letter of support. If there are elements of it that you don't like or you object to it, you're entitled to fill out an objection form. And all this information will be presented to the court. And the court will make a decision based on that, as well as legal arguments and other information. So that's the only deadline right now, is the May 3rd. That's optional. You don't have to. If you want to, you can. If you object, you are still entitled to participate in the compensation as well, if it gets approved. So that's where we're at right now. The registration forms that we made available, these forms are just registration forms. So you don't have to provide specific details on those. Those, all we'd like to see is your contact information. Uh, you can list your schools just so we know that you're part of the class. And then from there, it's a communication tool for us. When the official application comes out, we'll be able to provide that to you directly. Um, you don't have to fill out the details. On the last page, there's a section that asks for additional information. That's, that's optional. Um, there are some people who have told us they want to provide us the information right away, and, and that's why we've included that. But you don't have to fill that out. You can just provide your information. I think we have an information sheet as well with uh, Q&A, uh, well, questions and answers, if anyone could provide some basic information. Um, I think what I would say is we are now trying to, we have been trying to identify point people in the community that we can work with to share information and that individual or that party can then share information at the community level. Um, I'll say then that's largely it. Uh, there is going to be an opt-out period as well, I should mention. So after the court, you know, if the court approves this, there'll be a 60-day window where if you look at this agreement and you say, you know what, this agreement's not for me. I, I don't, this isn't what I want. You can opt out. If you opt out, you preserve your right to commence your own action. So that's just something that I wanted to point out. If you're not, if this agreement doesn't cover you, you're able to opt out after it's been approved. Um, so that's largely it. Uh, I think we have a court issue, because that's usually more colorful. Uh, but that's, uh, that's my presentation. I must say that I, I regret and I apologize for not coming here sooner um, because uh, you know I'm located very close, uh, but I am here now and uh, uh, my firm is very happy to come back again as we move forward with this to continue to provide information and make ourselves available so you have all the information you need to make our, the right decision. Um, so that's my contact information, our contact information. Um, I think that's pretty much it on my end. Uh, I suspect if you have some questions, as long as they're not too hard, I am very happy to answer them. No, I'm just kidding. Yes. Um, point of clarification, I'm taking notes that earlier you said the court date was September 14th and 15th. And what I've read so far is May, so it is, is it May? Yeah, that was a slip. So it's, uh, that the court date is May the 13th, 14th, and 15th. So make sure we delete that from the order. Yes? <clears throat> I have a question about this. I've been to three of these now with the uh, IEP, and I can affirm that it was humiliating. It was designed to deny us our rights to just appeal. And I can say with the second one, with the 60 scoops, we went through a presentation similar to this with Wilson Kristen, you're familiar with that large room, in which they deliberately deceived us, that's my feeling. They had us go through the same process as you're doing now. They had us sign papers that they said was non-binding, but we find out later that they denied us our right to participate in, what, in that settlement. And then we find out after constant appeals to that law firm to work with us, they would not respond to us, the 60s group generation, and they wind up making a settlement without our permission that diminishes Canada's liability from 1.3 billion to 800 million. 
case. There was no consultation with that. With the class action suit, we found out that the people who are the lead plaintiffs have the unilateral right to do that, to diminish any kind of final settlement. And that was, a, uh, that was just really upsetting. Yes. What we learned from that, what I recommended to the Mohawk Council about possessing is based upon our bitter experiences with this kind of process, that we turn it around. And we do something very simple, is that your firm contract with the MCA and the representatives of the Mohawk people and we, we, we redesign this to fit our specific needs. We form a Mohawk team that can go to our community and get this testimony that we can entrust to people that we know and then we form the basis on uh, which we can move forward on this kind of litigation. That you contract with us to do it instead of telling us that we have to respond to your forms in accordance with your standards that you give us the respect, you retain it, and hire us to do it in our manner so that we are actually working with you in full partnership. The mistake done before, we were responding to external agencies and they really screwed us badly, especially Wilson Kristen. And I do not want to see that repeated. This is our last best chance. There was no provision made with Wilson to actually preserve our testimony. When we asked them about records, that was very critical in the IAP and with Wilson, they said that we would be called upon to substantiate our claims, prove what you say is true, and that Canada retained the right to challenge us. So if we made any kind of uh, uh, statement that we were physically or sexually abused, we had to provide in detail documentation <coughs> as to that specific incident. And when you're 10, 11 years old, you can't do that. But that was used on the basis and to uh, uh, diminish and to, to reject our claims. Wilson comes along in the same thing. When we ask him, well, the only way to reasonably expect a settlement is if we can substantiate that. And that comes from our oral testimony. But they were insistent that the standard of proof applicable in Canadian courts applies here too. You've got to prove it. How are you going to prove it? They told us there were no records. How are we going to substantiate that? The same thing is here. Where are those records? How are we going to prove this thing to make our case as strong as possible? And the only way we can do that, given that Canada deliberately destroyed many of these records, is we have to rely on oral testimony. And that will come only when people that we can trust and confide in have the ability to access those very painful questions about what happened to us during our time in this school. So my point to you, if you're going to make this work, is to work with us in contract, retain our people to collect that information and then when, it, when possible to add records to that. So I would suggest if you want to make this work for us, you've got to contract with us and you've got to work with us so that we can get the information that you need to make a stronger case and that you guarantee to us that this does not amount to a concession of our rights, and that you guarantee us you're not going to make any uh, behind the scenes uh, settlement without our specific approval. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I mean, you made, I don't know if that was a comment or a question or a multiple No, that's, that's, a, that's a, I kind of tried to take it. It's um, a bitter fact. But, I mean, there are multiple points on that. And, um, where to start? Let's look at a few points. I won't be able to answer them all right here. I can't comment on contracting with you right now, but what I could say is this, is when it comes to records, all the records that are accumulated as part of this process will be dealt with the way each applicant chooses. So they can be returned or destroyed. Those will be two options that will be made available to everyone. Um, I think what I can say at this stage is uh, I can't speak for the practices of any other firms. Uh, I'm not sure the firm you mentioned, I'm not actually familiar with them. Uh, so all I can say is that as part of this process, uh, we are here to meaningfully present the information uh, for you. And uh, really, if you have questions or comments, I will try to take those back and work with those where I can. But fundamentally, if this process doesn't work for you, you always retain the right to opt out of it. 
So that's that's one thing I would say. Yes. Um, this uh, lawsuit with the paper was a 277 page report. So I read it and there's concerns as to the time frame. Yes. So if it is approved, yes. it's a 1.4 billion dollar settlement. Yes. And obviously you describe 200 million goes to the legacy fund. The law firm will take their cut, their share, whatever the new agreement, right? So the one-year time frame, how is that going to be prioritized when we have in our community elders sitting here who are in their 80s and 90s? Are they going to be the number one priority when these applications come in based on 200,000 or more applications? How is that process going to work? So I want to be clear, there's not going to be 200,000 or more. The class size in this case is estimated to be 120 to 140. So it's not 200,000. Um, what I can say is that your question, let me see, let me, so your question was, how are we going to start? Prioritize the elders yeah. being the ones that are dealt with first. We yes. 80, 90-year-old elders in our Yes. You mentioned, you mentioned something earlier uh, before that point as well. I just mentioned that the dollar amount is okay. the size of the capture So on that piece, well let's let's look at the one year period. Yeah. Year period. So let me start with that. Um, in terms of when the application process will start, what I can say at this point is we are probably six months away from that. So right now, if we look at this, you have a, a hearing in May the 13th. From May 13th, there will be a window of about 60 days where people will be able to uh, bring appeals if they're not happy. Um, and then there's a 30-day implementation date. So that's six. That's 90 days. You're looking at three months. That's assuming the judge makes the decision on the 13th, which the judge will not. The judge will reserve judgment in this case. It will come out perhaps a month later, maybe longer. So we're really looking at a period where the application process probably in reality subject to court approval will not start until anywhere from five to six months out from here. Uh, actually from May the 13th. From there, there is a one year claim process. You're right, absolutely. Um, so after that though, there is also a six month extension. Individuals are able to apply for a six month extension for that as well. Uh, so in reality, uh, we're looking at anywhere from a year and a half to two years from now. Uh, so we still, that's like, uh, that's, that's like before the, the claim process is over. Um, so there is still quite a bit of time in there. And so the only thing I can say is that through conversations such as this with community members, with community leadership, uh, we are constantly engaged with community members and leadership to discuss these types of issues and look at what the needs are. And what I can say about having the support available uh, for individuals is we are working on that right now in conjunction with the administrator, the proposed administrator, to make sure that there is a robust support network in place uh, for communities. And the details of that will be fully laid out on May 13th at the settlement approval hearing. How many interveners did you have by April 11th that heard carry motions? The interveners, we probably had uh, several interveners. What, several? 20, 50, 100? Several interveners. There were about seven. About seven? Yeah. And so we've had a decision on that. Um, all of those interveners were denied intervener status. 
So, yes. Uh, the settlement from the residential school students, et cetera, et cetera, is completely different than this one. Is that right? That's correct. They're completely different. Uh, the process here is designed to be less traumatic on individuals. You won't have to be cross-examined as part of this process. Like you're a prisoner. Pardon? Like you're a jailbird, a prisoner. Yes, you will not be treated like that as part of this process. No government lawyer will ever question you about what happened. Yes? Uh, in the settlement, you said it's under D, it says that this claim um, cannot be used or implemented by, by uh, students in 2006 residential school settlement. But I'm hearing that they can. I'm sorry, I kind of, I, I didn't hear you clearly on that one. Under, under the agreement, on page two, it's under the e students, the students who can apply for it, yes. does not include students who were included in the 2006 residential school settlement. Uh, I don't know what you're reading from, because our agreement, people who, who attended uh, the Indian residential, an Indian residential school, who were compensated as part of that process. That's a separate process. Even if you went to a, an Indian residential school and compensated, you're still entitled to compensation through this process. Yeah, I'm happy to look at that. Yes. May third is the deadline for objections. How many have you received so far? Objections. Right now, we're at. Uh, 20 versus 1, so that's the ratio. 20 letters in support and one letter of objection. That's the ratio right now. So right now we're overwhelmingly in support uh, from uh, community members. Sorry, but you didn't answer my question about the prior prioritization of our elders that are yep. in their 80s to when it gets in front of the board. And I realize the board doesn't exist in a corporation with the, the people that are going to be attached to it. Yes. So if, if our letters of support show that in this entire process that our community wants our elders aged what, 60 to 80 to 95 years old, 99 years old to become the number one priority, yes. that information is taken down and noted and when you get to that process where those decisions will be made so that they will become the priority of their claims being settled first? I think the fact that we have elders that require attention and support right away is something that we're working towards. Uh, and I'll just say I'm located in Ottawa and it's about a, I don't know about you, but it's about an hour drive for me to get here. Uh, and I think we'll be happy to arrive uh, very quickly to assist uh, the elders here in the town Yes? For the, for the people that are going to go further than the 10,000 settlement, yes. they will need kind of like uh, legal advice and assistance to go more. Are you going to pay for their lawyers? No, the way it works is, in this case here, the way it works is that you are you can access class council, certified class council, which is Galaxy of the LG, and we will assist you at no charge to you. So the way this has been structured is that um, we, as part of our fee, we have committed to assisting survivors, and we will not charge you for that. Uh, for the higher, for the higher, for everything. We are prohibited under this agreement from charging any individuals anything. So our fees come from a separate pot. They have nothing to do with the amount of compensation for individuals. So you're going to be informing the, the survivors of how that process will work out? Yes, we will return back after September. Uh, Oh, sorry, September. May. After May, I don't know why I'm thinking about September. Yeah. So after May, 
what uh, Cactus just told me June. So I'm coming back in June, and what we'll do is we'll lay it out more details in a comprehensive plan which will involve supporting the elders here on an expedited basis. Yes. So this action is only for the day schools. I, unfortunately, I can't speak about the boarding schools. I'm not that that part that aspect isn't included. Yes. 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 My phone. Your phone so on the last page of the application here, there's a phone number, email, fax. And I just wanted to announce that I have to have a little free stop. You can get this from me at the end. Yeah. So we would be happy to see with you if you have any questions. What is your name again? My name is Jeremy Bouchard. Jeremy Bouchard. <laughs> You know, we have uh, we have a one eight hundred number. So I think. Yes. One last question. That's all right. I'm going to stick around for a bit after. So if anyone has any individual questions, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Yes. So I started researching for the elders, and all the records of the past 55 years of anybody that went to school in Ontario, and their, their records from the Porto Island West, Porto Island East schools that were transferred to the city of Cornwall. I find the, the irony of 55 years of old records going by 1940 something, so searching for my mother's records, school records, have all been destroyed. And it's based on their policy of whatever the records management is. And yes. I went to uh, CCBS for all of these that went to school in Ontario. And for those that went to school in Quebec, and I, I found my records, right? So I was fortunate enough to find in my records of what they gave me at General, uh, from when I went to General Vanier. It lists the, the teachers of ours from St. Ridges School in, on my record, right? So I can't find my Quebec school records, though. So those school records that were destroyed were our elders again from the 1940s. And when they get to that process of needing to show something to where they went to school, yes. is that where your law firm can come in and assist us in researching where to grab those with the yeah. federal government or whatever government might have it? Sure. That's, that is an excellent point. So in terms of records and evidence and document production, that is something we can help out with. But I think the other point, though, what I would say is we designed this process on the understanding that there will not be records for some people. So we have created ways in which people can have, for example, a friend, a family member, somebody else who can attach to them going to that school. We're aware of that challenge. We know that records were an issue in the IAP process. So there are alternative ways to this process to establish that. Yes? In, in Quebec, which is St. Regis Island, there was a school there. Yes. Uh, and we're talking about the years they may have been there. We found uh, through the Indian agency office, there was a request to replace a, a wood stove for the school in 1898. Yes. And wanted another stove, so obviously they've been in operation much earlier than that. 18, 1898? I can't remember, my memory short. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my only question to that would be, is there anyone still alive? <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, and, and I'll just say, I know some opened a lot earlier, some opened in the 1800s, and we have that in here, but no one's really with us any longer that old, so we tend to be around, I think, about, yeah, but that's a great point, that's a great point. Given the time frame that's attached and the elders that have already registered, in the event, 
and their names are in the system. So when they fill out the application, the executor to the estate picks that up and you follow through with the executor with a compensation to yes. the, at the end. Yes. And my final question is, upon receiving the compensation, is it taxable? No. Non-taxable? No. Yeah. We've already looked into that and we're getting the letter to that. Okay. Like part of the agreement? Yeah. Don't on the back. May 13th, and the judge says okay whenever he does final or the federal government The federal government in this case is already a party to the settlement agreement. So they are in favor of settlement. The agreement we have right now, they are satisfied with it. So they wouldn't appeal it. What it would be would be some other third party for whatever reason that's not happy with it or has an issue with it. That's who would appeal it. So the federal government. I think that's going to be it for me because I'm I have no water and I'm completely. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go. Uh, there will be. Uh, excuse me. Jeremy will be back. Hopefully he'll bring Bob in June. So this is the radio. Pay attention to uh, Facebook. We'll have it all over. We'll do announcements.